this is Log, everybody, the Log User Group. Log. Um, Big and heavy as well. Go ahead and get started here. So a few updates. Uh, we do have a GitLab server now. So if you would like to have your own private repositories or even public ones, we can host it for you and we can give you a look, uh, view what it looks like real quick. We don't have the DNS names, unfortunately, or at least pretty ones. So here's GitLab. So I'm already logged in. So if you want an account, let me know. You have created your own SSH key pair. You upload it, and then uh, at this particular point, you don't really have anything. But you would have, you can do all kinds of stuff, integration with APIs, you can create your own groups, create your own projects, and um, so you can create a new project, and just, you know, this would be my GitHub, my, or my Git repository, test, you can say whether you want to make it um, private, internal, or public, and then you can assign it to a group. So we're going to be sharing this to OpenNSM, so any stuff that we want to work on with OpenNSM that wants to be private, we don't want to use GitHub because you have a limited amount of Private uh, repository available, you can put it on here. So, say I want to make, account, or make it under the log group, hit create project. And then I would have it, and then I have the SS key pair set up. I can go ahead and call it and push to it, and then we can use that to inter integrate with all the other stuff like the email and whatnot. So, that is that. Also, we have a IBM RS6000 now that I picked up at a Hamvention last year, and it looks like this. It's huge, it weighs so much. Will and I endured carrying that up his it's heavy, two, two or three flights of stairs. It was ridiculous. But uh, it's like this big, this wide, no. it's huge. But um, so that way we can play with proprietary Unix operating system if anyone's interested. So Unix? Unix, yeah, real Unix proprietary yeah, from IBM. That's what I learned. I so, cut my teeth on Unix. Like I had a, <laughs> when I first came to school here, I had a UX4 account. Really? Yeah, there was no such thing as a web interface for email. <laughs> I forget how old you are. It was before yep. Pine, even. Nice. So we can play with that. Uh, Linux in the news. So there was a huge vulnerability. One was, uh, that came out that was called Ghost. You may have heard about it, but it was a vulnerability in the Glib C library, the new C library. And it um, was a, a problem in the get host by name function, which used the res name resolution. And that's actually a deprecated function. You're supposed to use get address info now. But uh, get host by name was vulnerable to a, um, a potential, or an attacker could craft a string and pass it to the program as an argument and uh, corrupt any particular point of memory that was available in the program. And that it was in the specific location of the program was in get host by name actually calls a helper function called the N or underscore underscore NSS underscore host name or something like that. And, that is the, the vulnerable program that you can actually overflow there. So more details at the CVE and at that link above. Yes. The, the GitLab thing. Sorry, jump back again. Yeah, so like, sure. That's basically like GitHub, but we're hosting it. Yeah. We have full access to it. We're the only ones that can get on there. Right. So like we can have private repos on there without paying and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, that's, the, that's the idea. Like yeah. all the premier benefits of GitHub right. without having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you're gonna look at all of our secret stuff though. No, I'm not. We can have some mutual trust, right? <laughs> no. But see, this rolls out. So it actually created the repository. It tells you you can access it by HTTPS or SSH. gives you the URL right here. It tells you how to set up Git. You can go and tell you either the commands you can type to begin using the repository immediately. So it has directions. So go ahead and configure user account, user account and Git, and then run these commands, and then you can automatically uh, start working with it immediately. So, so if you've never right. used Git, <laughs> it's all this, and you've got to work with it. Just get a t-shirt oh. made. And it's like, yeah. just, just the initialization, but yeah. Um, this is a good way to get started with adding stuff to a, a, a fresh repository. So I'm going to take a, take a look at it. Let me go ahead and remove the project, because it's a test, and ad hoc. All right, closing that. What else we have? Uh, LXD, so Ubuntu, this has been out for a little while, has a, or a, well, I shouldn't say Ubuntu, it's a, uh, Blitz Containers Group has a, a uh, hypervisor for, or a so-called hypervisor for containers called LXD that consists of a command line client called LXC and the daemon actually called LXD, D stands for daemon. And this allows you to work in, with containers at a level that's better or more abstract than just working with individual ones. So you can actually have a daemon to manage it all. It's kind of like Docker kind of thing. It's more enterprise-y, designed for businesses and or people that want to play with them. But they have their own now, and I've been really wanting to play with it. So this is available. But this is not using Docker containers, so those are different. This is actually just straight up LXC from the Linux container people. 
So you're saying that this is more enterprisey? Is this no, no, no. I'm just saying I would. I was just uh, price the poorly said that, but what I meant is that it's designed for, for people putting systems in production and stuff to, to run containers, not enterprise, not enterprise per se. But, but is this open source? Yeah, yeah. This this is from the group of people that actually created Linux containers, the LXE. Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, you know, you've used they use LXE Dev Star and all those. And it's these guys. So it's just a better way to manage multiple. But is it, what's the warning curve like on this? I don't have these yet, but I hope we get to play with it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to work with them in my free time. Uh, next, so um, I actually forgot to look at this, but Docker 1.6 came out with the ability to work with uh, Docker. Our Vigor came out 1.6 came out with the ability to work with the Docker Vigor environment. So I would watch one of these videos. Well, they're so long, four minutes. But this is a way to quickly spin up Docker inside Vigor. So you can automatically have the provision, configure the, the VM for uh, running, for having the Docker uh, even running, so you can connect it with the client, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, check this out. Uh, we'll be doing, we'll be talking about Vagrant uh, more later tonight, because I'm doing a talk on it. But for now, um, we actually watch this after the talk. Maybe we have some time. Um, next, we have uh, LXC, also getting containers. We do a lot of containers in here. At least I know Shane and I and Wayland now are, are pretty interested in them, so they're, they're pretty cool. Um, so we'll be talking about a lot, of that, a lot of these in the future meeting, but LXC Tools 1.1.0 was also released, and it has it highlights where here is the ability to, to do uh, checkpoints and restores for containers, um, serialize the container state to disk. Do you see that, Shane? Wait, what? This allows us to serialize the container running state to disk for live migration and later local restoration. This might solve your problem. Yeah, I don't know. Just something to think about. I don't know. Just, just from ringing the way it sounds, it might be what you're looking for. We had that one call. I mean, like just the way that this word sentence is word. I'm not sure what they mean by serialized, but yeah, I'm not either. But it's potentially. But yeah, like small state. To, yeah, I would like that. So we should look into this. And also the new L this is a 1.1 that just came out of LXE tools. And then also it has support for running system D as the init system inside the container now. And in the scripts have been updated. So you can use uh, the LXE bridge, et cetera, et cetera. Also, I'm going to watch uh, more details on that if you're interested in it. But yeah, we should totally play with that. Also, I found this website for Education Epoch. This is where we talk about uh, good resources for uh, learning uh, Linux and related. And uh, this MOOCless website, uh, crappy, well, not, not too bad uh, web design interface or whatever, but uh, they actually have a list of all of the uh, MOOCs related to Linux. And of course, the one from the Linux Foundation is in here right here at, at EDX. So you can check these out. There's a few other ones here from uh, one of the operating systems that includes a discussion on Linux and this Linux fundamental ones from WMA, the World Mentoring Academy. So check these out. We're going to go ahead into proc period. This is where we talk about the proc file system or the kernel file system. That is a way you can interact with the kernel through a particular or through a file system called procfs. And um, this particular one here is talking about automatic stack layout randomization. And this is a security feature and that was introduced a while back that allows the stack space to be randomized so that if there's an exploit and it can be in a different location every single time every time the program is run at runtime. So um, you can't run an exploit and expect to have some particular instru instruction executed at a particular place because it's randomized. So it offers a protection in that regard. And you can actually, it's just, it's enabled by default on, on your, uh, your modern Linux kernels, but here's a way you can turn it off. So let's go ahead and fire up a VM. Um, let's do Actually, I got better ways to turn on. You'll be I use Vagrant for a lot of my stuff. I'm going to go ahead and increase the screen size here. Just a moment. All right, not created. Let's go ahead and bring up that virtual machine. So bring up a uh, brand new virtual machine using Vagrant, which we'll talk about later in the talk. Make it a little bit bigger as that comes up. So actually, it's put, I'm pulling in a base box, which is a container image and some information to describe about it, like some metadata. And then it's going to go ahead and set up networking for me. It's going to copy any files I tell it to, run any programs I tell it to. All of that is written in the bigger file. It makes it, uh, provisioning a new system very, very simple. We'll be able to log in in just a moment after the machine comes up. 
and I'll try a few times. We'll try to connect by SSH, but the system isn't ready to connect yet. It's not waiting. It's not accepting connections, but it will in just a moment. All right, machine boot is ready, and we're now able to get into the system by using the bigger SSH. Okay, and I'm in a brand new Ubuntu system, and what I'm going to do is become root, and we can check this out. It asks me for. So what we're going to do first is we want to find. Take a look at this file. So we can set a set to the value of two, which means it's on for everything that it could possibly be running with it. And what we want to do is we want to change the stack to zero, or the setting to zero. And now if we cat that file, you can see the value is set to zero. So now there are no uh, memory protection in regard to the randomization on right now. And this is bad. Uh, so another thing you can do is you can use this tool that I've never used before that I saw when I was researching this. Set arch, and it actually lets you set specific uh, flags to on the architecture per uh, program, so you don't have to do it system wide. And you can see the dash r here is the address no randomization option, and it actually written is able the randomization of the virtual address space. So in this particular case, if I want to run say ls, then LS with that off, that would have ran it with stack uh, randomization off. And as well, if you want to do it persistent within the kernel, then what you would do is that you would use this in the system control script because almost every modern distribution has this file, system control, the system control program reads on boot to actually apply specific things to your kernel, which is another way to interact with it. So we can actually just place uh, this here, this here, and then what we can do is we can actually apply it to the kernel and just say, Dash A, oh no, this dash, uh, what is it, dash P? Actually, forget, let's try it. Hmm. Yes, dash P, okay. Dash P, so dash P, and then the file that you want to read from, and then now you can see that it read that file and it said to zero anyway. Of course, we already had that since zero. So that's why you can do that. I was actually going to write a little C program to actually print out the memory um, address, but using the address of operator and uh, show you before and after, but I actually didn't have time to do that. So did not. But that, that's a quick way to demonstrate it. Um, before and after you set the option, you'll see a different, uh, well, the first one without the, without audio, you'll see the same memory address for that particular variable that you want to use, and then without it, um, or with it, you'll, without it, you'll see the same address, but without it, every time you run the program, it'll be different. So, FYI. And then we got the SSH section up now. Um, did you want to yeah. talk about it from here? Or? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so basically, I just added a couple of simple yet useful options that you can use in your SSH daemon config file. Uh, the first is the address family directive, and it just specifies what version of TCP IP the your SSH daemon is going to use. So, for example, if you're in an environment that has a whole lot of IPv6 or no IPv6, um, you can specify whether or not to use IPv4 or IPv6. Or if you don't really care and you want to remain agnostic to it, you could just use any, which is the default um, on a vanilla SSH daemon config. Also, the, the list and address directive allows you to differentiate uh, which IP address is actually providing SSH services uh, to the internet. So for example, you may have a host that has several different IP addresses, but you don't want uh, a daemon listing on each one of those. You can specify which of the IP addresses would have that. Alternatively, what you could do is you could, um, if you have a, a host with a single IP address, you could just specify that IP address, but a like a non-standard port uh, in this directive to have the one IP address listed on a different uh, different port than 22. Yep. Um, so yeah, pretty simple. Uh, you like to add that? Like, so uh, it's in, in uh, under networks when you're in system admin. If you're not using IPv6 and stuff, like I automatically auto if we're in environment we're not using that to um, communicate with different services, I'll automatically go ahead and uh, set address family to INET, so it uses the IP4 family. 
so that we don't have to worry about any issues with the firewall to, uh, of, of uh, any access controls to find a lot of people over in IP tables, but they forget the IP table doesn't work with IPv6. It's IP table 6, or yeah, IP table 6, they need to do that, and a lot of people don't configure that. So just setting your demons to actually listen on the on the, uh, the, uh, the protocol that you actually, the network protocol that you actually expect is recommended. So. Oh, and so the other thing is that I didn't mention, but it's in the notes. Um, you can use as many of these keywords as you would like. Um, so, for example, you could put 10 of these with a single IP address and you could have 10 different ports listening for SSH. Um, or you can, like if you have multiple IP addresses, you could use um, any number of those keywords up to the number of IP addresses that you have to specify which would be serving SSH. So these are these are options that you're adding on when you're trying to connect to a remote server? No, that, no so that, that's a good question. I probably didn't clarify very well, but this is in your SSHD config. So if you go to Etsy SSH, SSH, SSHD underscore config, uh, you would just add these options to that file and then restart your daemon. That makes a lot more sense then. So, and depending on your flavor of uh, OS, you could use, like for a Debian or Ubuntu install, you would just say service SSH reload. Or for Red Hat, it would be Etsy and it the SSH restart. So, anyway, nothing too terribly complicated. Cool. Yeah, so um, you're saying you can listen, up. <clears throat> listen on multiple ports for SSH requests? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you could do that with these keywords or with that keyword. Uh, there's another way to do it too. And could you shut down like the standard, standard port? You know, like say you still want to allow SSH access, but you only allow it to people that know to look for it on, you know, 1337 or something instead of 22. Or, or right. So you could not run it on 22, and you could just run it on any number of random ports. Right. Um, so you, obviously, you could even run it on other well-known ports like 25 or So would it be like an address or uh, then you write the port and then put false or something, or how would it? No, you could just say... You could just say 192.268.1.1 colon 20 or 21. You can right, well, you're it. telling it to listen, but how do you tell it to like to shut to not listen on a port? You just don't listen on that port. Oh, so it'll automatically have 22 in there or whatever. Right, that's the default. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you can also pass it on the command line to SSHD. Right. Dash right. P, I believe. That's cool. All right, moving on to shell space. Oh, but uh, I guess what the other thing I was saying is you could run it on like the default port for SMTP or anything, but obviously that could cause conflicts if you tried to bind to that port with another service. But right, right. You could right. do it if you wanted to. You know, I was just thinking of like it's not a great mitigation, but like just against obvious SSH attacks, like it's an obscurity tactic. If someone was actually sending uh, TCP traffic to those ports, they would be able to know. What was listening there? Yeah, and but how then you can also do port knocking on top of that. Right. So. So it's all yeah. That's interesting. All right, moving along to shell space. So um, in this particular one, talk about some uh, helper functions I use whenever I'm uh, programming in Bash. So I use this one called Hi, and it's just a way to to uh, after a, a a command returns true to say something that lets you know that it it met expectation, and then the opposite of that is this little one kind of called Die, a borrow from Perl's Die, that um, if a pro, if a if a, the exit status of some program executes as a greater than zero, then we'll uh, usually uh, execute this this function to do something like Send an email or write to an IRC channel or print a message with CowSay or by itself. And in this particular case, um, we'll show you how it's used. So let's just look for example of die. Okay, so we check for this, this kernel variable like this set. Then what we do is we do is wget whatever is set to this URL. So it goes grabs the, the kernel from this URL. But if wget fails and it is in return something greater than zero, then this gets executed with the or. So die is then takes control and it says download if kernel failed. So very simple way to print a nice little message. And if you go back up to die, what we can actually see here is um, 
what it first does is check if CalSay exists, and I have CalSay at the top. Uh, you can see very top highlighted. So it looks in that path. And if it's not there, then what it's going to try to do is going to echo to your screen. And what we're using here, we're using a shell variable here, the dollar sign, and the asterisk to match any arguments that are passed to the function. So in this case, it would be the, the string down the fail. So it matches any of it all the way across for that string, and then it prints it out. Then what actually happens, with, whether Cal is installed or not, what actually happens is um, it will write to IRC if it detects that the IRC client is at the top, is IRC say. And then um, finally, it'll check if your mail program is installed. And if it is, it'll try to echo or send that, that text to um, your system. Or the email address you provide above, I mean. So I have you have to fill it. It's user.company.com by default, so you just change it to whatever yours is. So there are two little helper functions that I use in my scripts. Um, and then finally, what we have was uh, this one I wrote in to do provi uh, provisioning of packages. I call it package check. And a lot of times when you're running scripts over and over provision systems, some packages may be installed, some may not be, but it'll go through and try to enumerate the entire list. It'll take a little bit before actually installing them if they're there or not. If they're not there, it won't install them. So I run this little script, or this little shell function that checks for the number of packages given in, the, in this packages variable, and then it runs it based on the operating system that you are running. Uh, Debian or Enterprise Linux would be CentOS, Fedora, etc. It tries to count, get the count of that and compare it to the number that you want to install. Um, and then if the, count, if the count is different, it actually uh, installs the packages that it needs. So um, that's just a quick way to not have to go through the entire list every single time. And it, basically there's another function called number of packages that you run. And um, you, basically an argument is the, the actual the number of packages, and they'll try to figure that out. So I run it right here. You can see that packages here, this should be a number, and it'll, whatever that is returned, and that sets a package count, and that is used to actually do the, the conditional here, whether the count of packages on your system is different than what needs to be installed, and then it'll, it'll execute appropriately. And the other cool thing about this little function is that it'll work on a Debian base systems or the enterprise. So you can give it any list, so like packages right here. So I can say I want to install cow say build essential flex Python. And it's either libraries and uh, no matter which system I'm on, I'm on, it will actually install the appropriate packages for that. So just a nice little helper function that are fun to play with. Um, we can actually do, let's do, um, show you, let's do high, That's you know, pb pb paste into high.txt source high. Now we can do high. This is a test. You can see that it just it just echoed that value. And it doesn't have cow it doesn't know where the location of cow say is. But if we set that, so cow say, where is cow say? Cow say is user local bin cow say. So we can go to high.txt, we can go up here, we can cow say is equal to user local bin cow say. At this point, we'll have to source the script again. And what we'll do is, all right, this is a test, and then it runs cow say, this is a test. So I like to have these, uh, I think it's kind of humorous and not so boring if you, if you incorporate things like this in your script. So, but in the case where cow say, cow say is, a, is installed, it will have like W get failed in, in the cow say uh, box. So I don't know, I kind of like it. but. And then die does the opposite. Uh, die actually uses cow say with the uh, option where his eyes are crossed where the cow is dead. So that's got a little a small difference. So it's just fun to play around with. Um, so there's that. And then finally, our, oh, okay, sorry, not finally. Uh, Vim vicinity is next. This is where we talk about little things with Vim, share tips and tricks. And let's see where I want to do my next thing. I guess we'll just do it. Here, so there's a few faster moves you can make. I uh, used to before I knew this, and I wanted to create a new line. I would go to the end of the line, press A to so go to append, and then press enter, and then that was three different keystrokes. But you don't really need to do that. You can just press the letter O, 
and it'll go ahead and create the new line for you. Uh, another one that is useful to do the same thing prior or before the line or the line above is capital O. So it goes ahead and you can just type capital O and it just saves you a few keys for if you can do that. And the other one was um, the F, which is a search uh, uh, character. So you can do this. I'll jump right to the character that you want. So if I type in F, the letter capital P, it jumps right to the location I want. F to capital S jumps to the location I want. S capital N jumps to the location I want. And uh, that's, that's just a quick, quick way if you actually end up being on a line and you don't want to have to go all the way across like that or go here, then go back. You can just use that to find the character that you want. I just want to jump to K. You can see how that's much faster than going like this to the K, or much faster than going like this to the K. So F, K, I'm at the K. I can begin editing the, 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 the stuff right there. So The other one was uh, the directory listings in Vim. This is actually really cool. You can use Vim to actually uh, browse the directory structure for files. So I'm going to use Vim. I'll go ahead and open it up. Do uh, colon E and then dot. And you can see it's actually the directory structure. So I can then pick which file I want to load. And I want to load new ISO to SH, and it actually loads it for me. So that's really nice. Um, so I often, when I don't know which file, instead of doing LS, when I know I'm going to use Vim later, I can just go ahead and do Vim into that directory, and I'll be fine. Um, you can do the same thing. You can just specify the directory. Um, so let's do user NC or Vim NC. And I can go through my Etsy directory and pick which file I want to edit. If I want to edit the profile script, I'll edit that. Um, another thing was um, using Vim. Vim has the ability with the, with that plugin that it comes with to actually open up tar GZ files. So you don't actually have to do tar and GZ and then or tar it or excuse me to actually list the contents with VTF. You can actually just look at them in, in Vim and actually edit them directly in Vim without actually untarring it, which is really badass. So um, what we can do is, I'm going to go find, I don't really know where they're on my system, but let's just do look for anything. Let's just talk GZ, but, oops, in my home directory. Looks so like there's one. There's a bunch of other ones. So let's go ahead and take a look at what well, looks good here. Um, so much crap. Let's just go to this one right here. Well, not sorry. Let's go to this one right here. Oops. So I specified a file, and this is what's in this particular direct in this file, the tar gz file, and I'm actually able to modify it from here. And where it's zipped up in this more than one file, um, let's do this again and get rid of the bro stuff. I probably should, one second, I should start for tgz actually. That's a, it's a better match because it's an archive rather than just a zip file. So here we go, bench.tgc. So let's go ahead and look at that one. So this is a, there's multiple files in this archive, and it's gzipped. And here they are, all these files. This is the directory that the files are in in the yellow. And if I want to edit kill gulp.sh, I can just press on it and actually loads that file in there. So it's a really quick way to browse what's actually in a tar uh, gz file. That would just be like because. Okay. And then uh, I guess that was really it. And then we can take it. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead and do a C corner with Devin. Hey, hey, can, hey uh, are you doing here? Yeah. Okay, great. Excellent. Does C work on Captain? No, I'm just gonna. Well, it doesn't probably, but that's just. I'm no, this is Folk Six compliance. Dude. I know. I know. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. But do you have a Folk Six? I don't know. Oh, this is some research. Or let's go. Actually, let's use this. Use that. Does it have your Does it have your MRC in it? No. Okay. Well, I'll just SSH into uh, EWS. Okay. Cool. Be careful with your wildcards. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to break anything. Might break the network. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about system calls, and uh, first I will explain what they are and why we need them. So on a lot of modern CPUs, they have some sort of security model. For example, in x86, we have the rings model. So there are a multitude of different rings. You can imagine them being concentric circles. Outermost one, or ring zero, allows unrestricted code access, and as you go towards the center, 
uh, you lose access to certain things. Like um, ring zero is usually reserved for the kernel, and then intermediate rings are for things like device drivers. And then finally, the very center ring, I think it's ring three, but don't quote me on that, is uh, used for application code. So let's say your app, I mean, if we didn't have those, it would be really bad because, for example, a user application without any privileges could just, for example, arbitrarily access the hard drive or the frame buffer or network card or anything, which means that things like file permissions would be meaningless because you can just access the bits of the hard drive. But on the other hand, the applications do have a legitimate need to access certain files. So that's what it, they use system calls first. It's for the OS to provide a well-defined API with uh, security checks to access uh, certain functions in higher rings. So uh, that's, yeah, that's why we need them and now how we use them. Uh, in reality, system calls are, you would write them in assembly but uh, that's, that, that's accessing it through the ABI, which is very error prone, because you have to you know, manually specify the calling conventions, all that stuff, plus it could change between different versions, different platforms. So Linux provides wrapper functions, and they're the preferred way to use them. There's also, okay, so just open a test file. And for example, Oh, and uh, how to find information about system calls. We will use the man pages, and uh, they're on page two. So, for example, man to open will give us information about the system call open. So, there we go, including the stuff we need to include. So, yeah, so uh, today I'll, I'll be covering a few basic ones. Open read, write, and close for files, and then fork and wait PID for uh, forking and dealing with multiple processes. And then you can, you know, read about the other ones. So. Are you talking about 7.4s at all, or? No, no, just because this is multi-process stuff, not multi-thread, so. Point. I can I, I can do multi-threading in a separate one though. Okay, so we will. Okay, yeah, and uh, the, so with the standard C functions like f read, f open, f write close stuff like that they use file pointers so that's something that's defined in the C standard and it'll work on Linux and it'll work on Windows but system calls don't use file pointers they use file descriptors which are you know unique to the Linux kernel so you code using Linux system calls won't obviously work on Windows and uh, unlike the complex file pointer structure that you know points at some like area of memory with a bunch of information, a file descriptor is just an int. So, and uh, there are a few of them with a special meaning, as we'll see. And okay, so first I will check if it includes more headers because I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first one I do, I'll do will be open, which is used to open a file. And C, you would normally do this with F open, but this is a lower level call. And, you know, F open on what is compiled on Linux systems ultimately does make a call to open. It just abstracts it away from you. So if you look at the man page, uh, so you first specify the path name and then flags. That's the basic idea. And we go down here. We have things like O append, asynchronous, create.
Yeah, so this is the layout is that we've been Okay, so uh, here we will be creating a file. And actually, first, before we do that, let's look at the closed system call. It's really simple. All you do is specify the file descriptor, and that will close it on error minus one is returned. And uh, the, the file descriptors that are already open that you should be aware of are zero for standard in, one for standard out, and two for standard error. So let's see, first of all, let us close standard out. And then we will open a file, let's call it log.txt. And uh, I'll create, I don't know, maybe we need to specify additional flags. And then we can use now, uh, and I guess I should be checking the return values, but I'm not going to bother since that's too much typing. So we'll close standard out, we'll open a log file, and then we will use, instead of write, we will use our standard uh, let's print F or put S or whatever, so. Hey, why do we need to close standard out? Well, we don't, but this is to demonstrate something about file descriptors, which you'll see. Okay. I mean. So let's see what happens when we run it. Uh, apparently been created with read permissions. Uh, have to look at the main page. Probably have to add some more flags in there, but I'm too lazy. So, or see if we can. There we go. Crap.
well. What I was trying to demonstrate is that when you close a standard out, the file descriptor will become available. And uh, when, when you open a new file, the system gives you the lowest currently open, or I mean not open, the currently available file descriptor. So if this had worked, and uh, it, it would take too long to figure out why not, a regular printf call without specifying which file or anything would have actually written to the log.txt file instead of standard out. Oh, well, actually, obviously, that one, so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so you've now the file descriptor of log.txt is actually one because that's the value returned by open. And uh, all, all put s or printf does is that it actually writes to standard, f. it writes to the file descriptor one, which is normally standard out. But in this case, it would actually be writing to log.txt. So there's probably an issue with the permissions or something. Yeah, it's not letting me read it. Anyways, so uh, yeah, it was a proper flags to open that could probably be avoided. So yeah, that's, so next I'll just do read and write. And uh, for this we'll implement a cat-like command, which will, but instead of reading from a file and all that stuff, we'll just read what's uh, read into standard in and then output it back to standard out. So first let's create a buffer, let's for example, make it 4K for the heck of it. And um, then while read, let's look at the man page. So we specify the file descriptor uh, pointer to the buffer and the amount we want to read in. And then on error, it returns minus one. So while read, We'll be reading from standard in, so that's zero. We'll be writing it to buff, and then we don't want to read past the size. While this is greater than zero, we will write one. So we will write to standard out, which is one. And actually, we need this variable because uh, if the buffer isn't completely filled because we've reached the end of file, we don't want it, or a new line or whatever, we don't want to output the garbage past the end of this. So we will write one uh, buff and then So as you see now, it functions like a normal cat program, and by default, uh, terminal is new line buffered, so it won't do anything until we actually hit this, and then when we hit control D, we'll detect an end of file and exit gracefully. So that's read and write. You can do the same thing with files, just replace one with the file descriptor returned by open. And uh, yeah. What was the bytes read for again? Okay, so. Uh, by thread. By thread, yeah. Yeah, we're going to Well, well actually, pronouncing it that way helps you understand a little better what it actually yeah. is doing, too. Yeah. It's a it's a buffer that holds the bytes that have been read. Yeah, so, uh, so read will return the number of bytes that it actually read. And uh, let's say that we don't read 4,096. Bytes. For example, what if it's new line buffered, it'll read it'll read how much there is until the new line or end of file that you send to it. So let's instead of bytes read, let's actually out, see what happens when we try to output the whole. Okay, so this is actually we get zeros or garbage data. Yeah, we'll get garbage because okay. it'll try to output the unlike string functions. Right, you have to specify the size of the amount that you want to write it out. So, so it'll be what's ever in memory, right? At yeah. Time. And since this is on the stack and it has automatic storage, there's no guarantee to what 
They could say, for example, go Seahawks for all you know. Just here so you don't get fined. Look, I so I hit test. Notice it does output test, but then it outputs the rest of the contents of the buffer up to 4K bytes as well. So, oopsie. I obviously don't want it to do that. Equals 99. And uh, yeah, and it actually screwed up the terminal. So clear. Type reset. Reset. Yeah, that's what I did, but. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, T put space normal. <laughs> control C do things. I I did do control C. I don't e I don't even know whether I'm in or outside of this. Keep the wild card. Gonna, I'm just gonna close this tab and then open a new connection. I think <laughs> probably the safest way to go. Nope. You just dropped his whole his whole file system. Oh, yeah, I did. It's okay. Oh, no, you were on EWS, right? Yeah. So. Can you do a uh, Apple Shift Plus? Shift. Increase the terminal size? Oh, plus. Okay. Did you see this D shelf uh, forensics framework, the Army release? Okay, so I, I, I didn't have a chance to look at that one. It's very bad not to keep track of the number of bytes that you've read in. Okay, now we will do what would I think one of the coolest things. I'll do fork, wait, PID, and exec. So those are incredibly useful. For example, just today for uh, one of my classes, I was writing like a stripped down version of make. So it goes and it uh, reads the, you know, reads the targets and executes all the commands under it. But the exec command will actually replace your process image in memory with the image of the process you're trying to execute. So uh, that's if you just have a single process, it's going to completely wipe out what you had before. Just run that command and then quit. So you actually want to have it spawn a new process, a child process, and then have that child process run the command and then report its status back to the parent process. So you can do this. And uh, well, first I'll just do a simple demonstration of fork, uh, which will spawn a child process. Are you in a fork while in EWS? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, we're all witnesses that it was an accident. Yep. <clears throat> so it's yeah. a good thing to know. You should actually teach us this so that we know what not to do. You're right. supposed to put <laughs> while one fork, right? Well, yeah, but the idiomatic C way is for semicolon semicolon. But yeah, then you would, yeah. So uh, don't do this. <laughs> they could exhaust some resources. On well, especially if you. Throw something in there to actually do. Yeah, like uh, computing pi or something. <laughs> <laughs> right? We yeah. take down the network in what, about four seconds? Uh, okay, so the syntax for fork, actually, I'll, I'll show you guys something really cool. Um, so, first, I will have it print a statement I am process, kind of like I am Groot. And then we will. And mommy. Yeah. So if fork equals zero. So how fork works is that in the in the parent process it returns the PID of the child process, and in the child process it returns zero. So that's how you can tell which process you're in. So uh, if if so if now if we're in the child process, we will we will now want to print out. So uh, we will print out our own PID and then the PID of the of our parent and uh, our. Actually, I should, yeah. So and it note if our parent process had done get PPID, it would probably print out the PID of either of the shell, or uh, we could actually kill the shell and uh, have it be acquired by the initial process, but anyways. Now, just by looking at this code, you would think that uh, IAM process would be printed out once, right? 
just by looking at this code because it happens before fork. Mm -hmm. so, so let's see what happens. Oh, and the, the fork is the same copy, doesn't it? Of the yeah. Program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but it, it apparently it printed out twice. Can anyone tell me why that is? Yes? You, didn't you were in that class, yeah, so you don't count, actually. But yes, so, uh, 241. Yeah. So, uh, because of race conditions? Well, no, it's because printf by, uh, we'll put the thing into the terminal buffer, and uh, by default, standard out is new line buffered. So, and then when you fork, it creates essentially a perfect copy of the process. So it'll actually copy the buffer. Then when you call printf a second time, it will, first it'll flush the, it'll like append this to the buffer and then flush it once it reaches the new line. So since I am process was already in there, it'll be printed out again. Now for if we added like a dash n, or if we added a new line here, or we put in an additional command to flush the buffer, or anything like that, then... I don't even know if new line will necessarily do it. Because standard out is new line buffered, so a new line is guaranteed to flush the buffer. You can change that setting to programmatically. You can, for example, if we printed this to standard error, we wouldn't have this problem because standard error isn't buffered. It prints out the characters. So here now, it will only print this out once. No, print it twice. And then we can all do all sorts of uh, cool stuff with this. And uh, for example, yes, uh, Professor Angre mentioned this, but I'd seen it before. There's an algorithm on 4chan called sleep sort, where it takes a list of numbers and it forks a bunch of processes. Each one is assigned to a number, and each process sleeps for the number of seconds equal to the number, and then prints it out. So you'll have it print out all of the pro all of the numbers in the list in order in O of n time. So it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a very neat algorithm. Okay, and huh. uh, <laughs> that's actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Only problem is when you have like one, two, three, a million, it might take a while to complete. But <laughs> but yeah. So yeah. So that's a just tells you that linear is not always the best. <laughs> Yeah. So, for example, if we have something like this, then we can then we can fork it. So now, if we're in the child process, we're going to run exec, and there are actually several variants of this. Uh, exec L is one of the most frequently used. And uh, for example, so then the first argument will be the binary to execute. So we could put in something like uh, bin sh, or let's just put bin ls, for example. And then the next argument is what is received as the first argument by the process, which is by convention its name. So we could pass in anything, but usually we want to pass in the same thing, which is bin ls again, or some processes might get confused if you do the wrong thing. And then, for example, for arguments, let's do LH, for example, just for the heck of it. And uh, notice, so this call will, unlike, for example, calling system, this will actually replace the image with LS. So once the child process terminates, um, this the program will not continue running in the child, it will also terminate. So the benefit of this is if something goes wrong with the call, we don't even need a conditional. We can just uh, assume that if it gets past the point of exact, it fails, and then return the appropriate error. Otherwise, we are going to wait. So there's actually, wait is a special version of wait PID. So man to wait PID here. Wait for a process to change state. So we know the PID of the child process, and if we just have wait by itself, we have a pointer to an integer variable called status where we can uh, read it. And then from there, we use some macros uh, that are provided for us, like did it exit? What was its exit status? Was it terminated by a signal or interrupted? You know, did it core dump? All that stuff. 
uh, was it stopped? So that's uh, and we can use those macros to access those fields of status. And uh, so we actually let's replace this with this PID T PID equals George and then if PID equals zero, then we will execute this or else we'll have a status variable. And then by default, if if you don't, let's go back to the demand page. <coughs> It was wait PID, you have to pass in the PID of the process you're waiting for an option. But in wait, by default, it waits for all child processes. So in our simple example, there's only one child process. <coughs> so we can just do this. <coughs> and then assuming all that is good, we will exit successfully. <coughs> to include the actual directory. It's just very directory. And there we go. So it prints out, uh, it gives us an LS of the current directory and we can use those macros to check things for like the return value. So we can see whether the return value was zero, non zero. We can check whether it was terminated by a signal or did it exit itself gracefully, all that fun stuff. So that is fork exact and weight PID all in one. And yeah, so you can also do cool stuff with open, read, write. And you can look in the man pages for plenty of others. I, there's also, for example, the kill call, which uh, is the equivalent of kill on the command line. It's a very sadistic term, but it just means send a signal to a process in general. You can specify the type of signal. <coughs> so you can use it to kill other processes or um, tell them to do stuff. So, yeah. And that's it. Any questions? Where did you learn this stuff? Uh, well, I mean, I'm in a systems programming class right now, but for the most part, I yeah, they come out of it. Man, since I did, I did do a lot of C programming in my spare time. So, yeah. Cool. Devin's a prodigy. When you're starting out, what kind of things did you do or spend time with? Uh, well, here I'll, I'll show you an example. Or... Actually, this is. Uh, this is RC4 with a modified key schedule, actually. That is safer than the default by how much no one knows. But uh, I, this is basically, I'll show you, like I can show you, it's used for encrypting and decrypting things on the fly. Like this is the actual algorithm. And then this, for example, we will here, like the usage, encrypt, decrypt streams. Uh, it reads something in from standard in, encrypts it, and prints it out to standard out, and you can do cool stuff with this. For example, this is kind of a contrived example. So when you do, for example, curl google.com, I mean, you could also do this with a porn video or something that you don't want to ever touch your hard drive unencrypted. So uh, curl google. So first, okay, well, I don't have it in my bin on here, so. So let's see what the usage is. So encode options key for so for example curl google.com 
let's add the dot slash a code. Let's uh, make our options dash n20. This is it uh, modifies the key schedule to remove vulnerabilities in the original version. Let's make our key cheese pizza, and then let's pass this into base64 to encode it, and let's write it to a file called taxes, because that's always an option to so know it works there. So we run there, and then if we view taxes, it's just going to be a bunch of base64. and. Uh, so now if we pass it in, first we decode it, base64-d, and then dot slash encode, dash d, dash n20, our key, which is cheese pizza. I did not spell this correctly. We will get back the original thing. So this is actually, I tested the throughput. It's in excess of one gigabit per second because it's written in, oh, yeah, it's written in C, so you could actually do something like download, have a wget or curlers, or yeah, wget, I guess, stream, let's say stream a video from a website, and then output it to T, for example, or yeah, like have it so that it, you pass it through VLC so you can watch the video while it's streaming, but at the same time pass it so that it saves but already encrypted to your hard drive. And then when you want to watch it, for example, you can just uh, cat the file into this to decrypt it and then stream it into VLC to actually watch it. So the, you, the unencrypted video never actually needs to touch your hard drive. So this is like one of the projects I worked on before I actually took the C class. So, yeah. And then I did some other stuff like uh, writing, writing tools to access APIs for websites, or writing bots, for example, to troll people. <laughs> so yeah. Did you use that to actually hide porn from your parents at home? Well, no, I didn't because I had no need to. <laughs> it's not like it's not like they could get onto my computer even if they were trying. So it's not. <laughs> what year are you? Freshman. Can you me how old he is? How old are you? I'm 17. Bam. What year are you actually? In your <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, he's a red shirt freshman. 17 year old senior. Yep. See, I wasn't really kidding when I said that thing about the president. Oh, you're a senior yeah. in college? Yeah. On, on, on numbers. Wait, by credit hours or by how close you are to graduate? By what? By, by credit hours or how close you are to graduating? By credit hours. I don't actually have all the requirements. Okay. Uh, I, I think before the semester started, I had 93. And uh, by the end, I still have like 111. So. The AP classes did you take? Three. <laughs> community college credits? Or? Mostly from ISU, actually. I did take a few community college classes, but it's, yeah. What's your favorite kind of pizza? Uh, well, I mean, I don't really like pepperoni. I don't really like, uh, you know, Hawaiian, so I'd have to go with cheese. <laughs> would it be safe to say that that would be an encryption key you used? Yeah, I think it would be, but not in production, just for uh, okay. testing. <laughs> so did you figure it out? Uh, no right up thing. Oh. Okay. All right, and then the small talk I have is on a Pixie Boot server that I've been working on, and I'm going to demonstrate it, how to use it live. So, does anyone know what Pixie Boot is? Yeah, this is really cool. So, yeah. Sorry. Do you want me to answer, or do you want to? Answer? Yeah, anybody answer. Well, it's like it runs a process before boot, right? Yeah, you yeah, so Pixie itself is a bootloader and then you can you tell it to actually load something else. So it's a way to do unintended installs of Linux. And uh so I used again I created a Vagrant VM and um it's called is that an E machine? So go ahead and uh triple E, yeah. PC I one of those. I say it's just triple E PCR, sorry. What? Uh but I'll go ahead and uh pull up my right now. Repo here. Good job. 
And I did two different ones. I first did the, the regular Pixie one, and then I did a Pixie multi-boot server. Well, let's do the Pixie Kickstart one. And this is a Vagrant uh, setup, so you can actually, if you have Vagrant ready, we'll talk about next. You can get clone this repo and have your own ready to go. Um, so first, let's talk about what it is. So what this will do is the script will download the latest our Ubuntu 14.04 LTS, the ISO image that you would burn into to a disk, right? What it will then do, it will configure um, DHCP to give you an IP address, and then it configures DHCP to actually pass you, once you get an IP address, the Pixie Linux.0 file right here, and this is the actual bootloader. So once you get an IP address, you actually get this file. Your system will boot it, and then what actually happens is that file will have a list in the menu, in the v, this VESA menu, C32, from a syslinux. What actually will happen is it will tell it where to then boot the next thing you want to boot. In this particular case, they want to boot Ubuntu server. It tells you where the kernel is. It's in this directory that we downloaded and put it to. And then here are the options that you actually pass the kernel. And it's just IP addresses and stuff of this my system. So the problem was, I'm tired of carrying around Linux stiff on CD-ROMs, burning them, or DVDs, and USB sticks. Every time a new, a new one comes out, you got to burn it again, or you got to copy it to the USB stick. It's a pain in the ass. So why don't I have a, a way that if I always if I have my laptop with me at all times, I can easily boot a system. And that's essentially what this does. So we're going to go ahead and, oh crap, I can't actually disconnect from uh, the network, so I'll lose my uh, video feed. Hold on, let's see if I can do Wi-Fi. We'll still lose it on the switch over. Huh? The switch is over. Uh, hopefully it does it smoothly. I've had it cases where it did. It has it. But um, so at this point, whenever you actually build, boot up this version of this, this VM, any network that you're on, you're going to start handing out DHCP leases. So if everybody in the room had Pixie ready to go, I could boot them all in my image. So um, typically, that's not enabled by default, though, and the system has to be in this boot process. But in this particular case, I can, anytime I want to have my laptop with me, I'm going to work on site at a client's or something, or at home, and I don't want to burn anything in the disk, or I don't have USB, I can literally just category, plug or even a cable into my laptop and into the, the system that I want to install Linux on, and then turn it on, and just select the, this Pixie Boot client, and then I'll actually be able to install Linux. So let's see what happens with this. Um, we may lose video. I hope not. Um, is there any participants with this? No. Okay, so I'm plugging. Wait, let's hold on. Switch. Uh, okay, sweet. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and plug it in my laptop. And then I'm going to go to my Pixie Boot system, and this is the multi one right here. Vagrant status. I think the machine is off right now. Power off, so it's off. But now let's do Vagrant. Vagrant up to turn it on. And let's go ahead and boot the machine. And this machine is going to be my Pixie Boot server. So I'm carrying around the virtual machine on my laptop CI. So I've made this in such a way that you guys can all download it and use it yourself. I did all the hard work already. I even had it, have it so that you can run, I wrote a script called new ISO. So you just do new underscore ISO and you give it some command line arguments, including the ISO sort of download uh, that you want to provision. It'll download it, it'll unpack it, and it'll create a Pixie service ready for it to go. So um, yeah. it's pretty sweet. And then I'm working. And I'm doing one for uh, other styles, like where they're just tar balls of Pixie. You'll find that too, like Kali Linux. If you want to have those, there you go. They they release theirs in a uh, a tar ball. I'm bringing a new script called New Underscore Pixie. They actually will do that. So just a moment, that'll be on. I'll be ready to go. And I'll fire this guy up, and this guy should be able to uh, boot. And I'll show it to you in just a moment. Let's give it a second. It's booting. And then we'll talk about kind of a little more about how it works. The condition is that that other laptop has a Pixie on it. It has a Pixie client on it, yeah. And, but, uh, one thing about this is most of your modern laptops will have that already in the BIOS. They're all they're all configured with that usually. I've never encountered one that did not have it. Okay. So, so even this little dinky $200 triple E PC has it on here. Wait, so you said Pixie on your daughter? Yeah, well, the, uh, well, then what's like dummy boot or raw? 
Well. Grub and bootloader as well. I don't know. I never heard of gummy poop, but Lilo uh, and Grub are both bootloaders as well. Yeah. Um, but this was designed. This Pixie boot program, like the, the actual file is PXE Linux zero. That will, is actually designed to do network installs. So it's a very small bootloader. It doesn't have the features that Grub has. Right? It's very small. Okay. It's just enough to say you can tell it where to actually get the operating system, where you can get the actual kernel, where you can get the actual file system. So it. So it doesn't have it all itself. You have to go out and download it, and it's smart enough to be able to do that. And then this will run on the new Windows bootloader, right? Huh? Will this work on the new Windows bootloader? What's it called? The uh, EFI? EFI. Yeah, EFI. Yeah. Um, I don't know actually. I think it might if you turn off Secure Boot. Oh, yeah, that, that may be. I actually don't know much about that. So uh, EFI, I don't know much about it. So you say new machines? How new is new? It can, uh, oh, I mean, within the past seven years, probably, all your servers will have it. You should try it anyway. I'll just show you how to, huh? How we have old machines. Oh, well, I mean, uh, there's a good chance we'll have it, too. That's just a, just a guess. I don't really have any substantiation for that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, your thing doesn't seem to be working. It's going to come up. It's going to take some time. I gotta go. My homework stay. team needs me. Might if we stay up here? Lock up? Yeah, you better. I'm landing on desktop. Done. Can you make sure it's locked up? I gotta go. I got a homework emergency. Well, I didn't do this last time. It took a little bit, and it worked. So hopefully, we'll have the same. Uh, it will actually work. Well, I can fire up the other one. I wonder if it's because your Triple E machine is not getting access to the internet. No, this thing's not on yet. Uh, We're just trying to fire up the VM. The VMs, it's probably the same things in the VM. But I'm expecting the mission call because it's running ECP service, so it might actually, it never can fix a little hit. Um, but don't worry, it'll, I think it'll eventually come. It's going to be a little bit of flat science to come up through. But if not, I can do it in a different way. Well, this is just the ALU. So. Well, while we're waiting, yeah, it's yeah, like I can bring. I did replicate instead of this one. I'm going to just do so Minecraft. So, carry what you have with me, like, and don't help me. So much logic. I had to be like based on it. Aha! Machine booted and ready. This took forever. <laughs> See you later. See you later. I should probably cancel this one to be honest. Far waiting, I'm going to show you what this is like. I'm going to fire my triple E PC. In this particular case, you press the escape key, it gives you the boot menu. And you can see at the very bottom it says Network Atheros Boot Agent. And that's what's actually easy to do the Pixie. So I can go down, press that, enter, and it, will say, it says uh, for the Ethernet controller, and you can see it's getting trying to get a DHCP address. But at this particular point in time, this one's not ready, I believe, to access the or uh, sending out the actual leases yet. But in just a moment, whenever this thing comes up, you will be able to get an address. What will then happen is the address will have a field in the DCP message that says, hey, there's a Pixie boot file. So load the bootloader. And then the configuration files, Pixie the bootloader will actually say, oh, well, grab Linux from my virtual machine IP address and just announce it from NFS. So, you don't need that for every Pixie boot, but if you're going to do multi boot, you need a way to distribute it, and NFS is the way to do it. So it's just a process to share. So Pixie bootloader would just mount a share from my system and then load the system and actually pull over the files. What year are you in? I'm not a student. Uh, I work on NCSA, I'm on the security operations team. So. What is NCSA? Acronyms, I don't know what they are. Uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's a big academic research organization. It does a lot of high performance computing. We have one of the world's fastest supercomputers. So, yeah. it's a cool place to work. 
But uh, so the way this is configured is while we're while we're waiting, um, let's go back to the actual the other one I have, the multi boot, and see that this file here. <clears throat> so after all my helper functions. This is the menu that is installed at this, at this, at this, these directories and this defaults. This is the default boot menu in, in x 8 And it says, hey, load this menu, it's a C32 file, you set a timeout, and then include my pixie file, pixie.com. So these are some files that you can actually set up to access, set the options in the menu. And the first thing it gets is a lo boot local. So in the menu, you can be like, oh, I should boot from a regular hard disk. That's one, that's one option you can do. The other ones are for each place distribution that you want to add it. And then actually those are the pixie.com file, which just set the color schemes and the, the width of the terminal, the rows and all that. So um, nothing too fancy there. And at the end of the script, when it provisions, it actually starts the TCP. It's the TFTB daemon, because you actually need something that's un unauthenticated. And TFTB is a unauthenticated uh, um, protocol. And then we'll use that to actually pull, pull the pixie image. And then uh, and the NFS actually, that's just for kickstart. I don't have all of that working yet, but uh, and the, the NFS is just to share all the Linux distributions. Um, see, that's just, this may not come with this. This is actually the slowest server. Let's try to do your NFS at HC. I'm in. Strange. Oh, wait, that might not be the right machine. Hold on. Figure it H-config. I have multiple VMs running configured, so this is part two, two. Yeah, that's right. That's, that should be it. Because it's an kind of restriction. That's right. So I am in the machine. And so let's be coming up to service. So let's actually go ahead and make sure that the DCP service is running. It is not running. That's what we need to get your ass. Start it. No, oh, it is. DCP, DCP. Let's first check the yeah. Uh, we need to give, we need to have an IP address. So, config, oops. This. So to that, and now let's run. Let's see if this will. Uh, yep, yeah, now it's starting. I didn't have an IP address because the way this would work is if you, if you once you build the VM, you haven't plugged in the network. My scripts get the IP address of the VM and auto configure it for you. But in this case, since we're not plugged in the network, I'm plugged directly into this machine with no uh, DCP settings, then I have to have my own. So now that's up and running. So now what we do is we'll go ahead and restart this machine. Escape. Let's get ready to load the Atheros boot agent for Pixie. Hit network boot. DCP, Shermo. Yep, there we go. So there's the Linux menu. And you can see I can choose between booting a Hoka hard drive, Ubuntu, CentOS, DBAM, the Derek Boot Nukes, uh, just our ISIS image, uh, Gparted, and other versions of machines. So I'm going to go ahead and hit CentOS. And then hit CentOS 6.6. And you can see at this point, it's actually uh, loading the Linux kernel and then loading the RAM disk image. And then just a moment, we're actually going to boot. We'll have those in memory. We'll be able to actually mount the root file system. There we go. So actually booting Linux right now. You can see the logs coming across the screen. Takes a little bit because it's over the network. So now it's unpacking the root file system image into our as RAM, uh, init RAM FS, switching the clock. So it's actually booting the system. And soon enough, we'll actually have um, the actual install menu of CentOS. So now I just have just, just the display. There we go, right there. We can install CentOS. Take a look at that. Pretty badass. If I don't save myself, let me forever do all these things because the problem is every image is different. I figure out where all the kernels were 
each distribution, and they all put them in different places between Fedora, CentOS, Ubuntu, Debian, all of them. And then I had to figure out all of the where all the RAM discs were, and then copy to the appropriate places. And I wrote a script to do majority of that. But I can add your distribution if you on request. So that's it. And if you want to have your own, at this point, uh, presuming that you actually have a supported one by my script, what you can do is go back here. If you go to the Vagrant file, it actually shows you what you can run. So if you want to create a new ISO image and you want operating system Ubuntu and you want version 14.04, fill this out. This is the way to track it. And then just specify as the URL the ISO image. And it will download it and it will unpack it and it will create uh, the appropriate pixie menu for you automatically. So in this particular case, I guess I just put a comment out the example so people if they want to look at the file they can see the examples. But if I ran this in here and we wanted to do um, so new ISO, right? And we want to say, hey, let's do um, yeah, new version seven of CentOS. Here's the here's the ISO image. And there's like I have my high message from Castle the helper function I talked about earlier. So I check the directory. It mounted the ISO file as read only. Now it's copying it over. And now at this particular point, we already have a boot configuration with Pixie for this version of CentOS. Super simple. Pretty sweet. All right, and that's Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it should be recorded or not. Nope, it is still being recorded. Great. All right, so I can, I can cut that out. All right, so at this particular point, so now we stop that we're good again. So um, we want to go to tasks. This directory just created. We're going to type vagrant in it. And that just creates a new, brand new vagrant file. It says vagrant file has been placed in this directory. So now you're ready to create your first virtual environment. So you just open it up. And it's pretty simple. Uh, all the comments, you can come out the stuff you need. But uh, a base, then you need a box that's built off of. So Vagrant boxes list shows you the boxes you have installed. Whoops, boxes, Vagrant box, so boxes, not boxes. List. So you can see I have this many different boxes installed. One for Arch Linux, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, etc. And so that means I don't actually have to go. If someone using this box already, you doesn't have to go out to the internet and download it. But let's go back to the Vagrant website. So you go ahead and download this. It's a really sweet tool, and you have. Uh, packages for a number of operating systems. And what you do is you just create these Vagrant files to describe what the, what the thing should look like. So we can actually go ahead and first, right off the bat, uh, use a box that I already had. So we saw that one of the boxes was Ubuntu, right? So just a quick look again, Vagrant box list. You see that I have Ubuntu already. Uh, oh, I have it named as Ubuntu 12.04. So I'm actually gonna have to do some edit that just to match that name. 12.04, and then what happens when I do Vagrant up, it's actually going to import that box in this new directory so that I have Ubuntu 12.04 ready to go. And Vagrant has a certain configuration. It already has the uh, SNS keys ready to go. They're the same. They're shared with all the boxes. This is specific, specific format if you want to create your own boxes and have them shared. But you can go out on the internet and you can download your own boxes. So uh, let's do Google Vagrant boxes. Here we go. And uh, has a tool for discovering boxes. You can actually pull it from their public Vagrant catalog. And um, so people have their own. So if you want to download Ubuntu Trusty, you can use that. So you can do Vagrant Box Add. You'll have Ubuntu Trusty, right? So just a way to quickly grab what boxes people already have out there. Um, also, what, what the unique thing about this is this gets your VM. So you can have all your tools ready to go in this VM and repackage it as a new box or you can write a script, which, would, which is what I do, or use some provisioning tool to actually install everything that you want. So we, are, we have a brand new machine up running, right? Uh, everything is set, so now we can actually SSH in. So we use Vagrant SSH. We do it in the directory. So everything in Vagrant is, is based on a directory. So if you have four VMs, each VM would have its own directory with its own Vagrant file in each VM. Now you can do fancy things with Vagrant files. Uh, now they are, they are uh, a Ruby. You can do uh, you can do like a loop in there and bring up four VMs at once or something like that if you wanted to. 
I actually have a cluster I've done in Vega using Bro. But there it is. So the VM's right there. I just logged in. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy the box. I don't want this box anymore. It's just a test system. So let's destroy it. So it actually removes the VM. And by default, Vagrant works with VirtualBox only. So VagrantBox is the idea of providers. And you can do VirtualBox. You can do VMware. Actually, VMware costs extra money. You have to, have to pay a fee for it. But I use VirtualBox for all because it's free and it works well. So uh, if you have, you have installed VirtualBox, then you have to install the Vagrant, and then it works. Um, from, from there, let's go back here and go remove that directory. There'll be some other stuff in here that we're create it. So remove that. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to go to my other Vagrant repository directory on the host on GitHub. And we'll bring up a system. Or we'll look at some Vagrant files actually first. So let's look at this bro cluster. So here's the Vagrant file for the bro cluster. It brings up three machines. Actually, I want to do that. Yeah. It brings up uh, three machines. Here's the first one. Vagrant configure do. It actually pulls in the trusty box. If it's there, so it tries to match it like I showed you with the box list. But if it's not there, Pull it from this URL. Like Ubuntu, for example, hosts their own Vagrant boxes online. So you can find out where they are and you just put in the URL. And if you do not have it on your machine, it'll actually go out and download it and call it trusty. And then the next time you need it, it'll be important right away because you already have it. Then we, we do a loop here. What I'll do, or this manager, what we do is we do, uh, we set the host name of the virtual machine, set up the networking, give an IP address, copy over some files. That's the provisioning stuff I was talking about. And then you can tell it to run a script. So I can run a shell script, for example. So it'll run provisionmanager.sh on the system as soon as it comes up. We'll give an example of a simpler file, though. That's not the best one. Uh, let's do islet. This brings up an islet system. And go back. OK. So what's actually happening here is it's going to bring up a system called islet, assuming the name of the VM. And then it's going to allocate uh, one gigabyte of memory and then one CPU for the virtual machine from the host. And you can do other things like sync a folder. You can mount a folder in the host system inside the VM if you want. You can do this just one line right here, given the source and destination. You can also do um, forwarding uh, guests or ports so you can communicate with the host directly, which is nice if you're bringing up a, maybe a web server stack or LAMP or something with Apache and you want to do some programming or mess with the website. You can do that. And you can use your browser like Firefox and just type in the actual uh, guest posts or guest port and actually connect to that. No way to do it. So in this particular case, we're going to bring up this islet system, uh, presuming I don't have it already uh, running. Ooh. It's be in the directory. So like I said, it's all directory based. So you got to be in the directory of each one. I'll check the status here. That's off. We're going to provision a new one though. We want something that I haven't done yet in a long, at least in a long time. Let's try this one. Not created. That's what we want to see. We want to see that the VM was not created. So that actually from this process of scratch. So you can see in this one, we have a Vagrant file. We then have some configuration files that are in a script. The script installs all the packages that I want to have after the VM comes up. So this installs CalSeg, Git, Build Essential, Check Install, Automate, a bunch of development tools, right? And then what actually happens is if we look at the Vagrant file, these file um, provisioner types, copies a file from the source directory, so in my current directory, to a file on the system. So I can quickly copy over files. So I'm going to copy all these configuration files right here without the provisioner, and to this virtual machine. Go ahead and bring it up. So this is also a really cool way. Like people actually build these all these VMs already. If you want to, if you need some piece of infrastructure, like a LAMP stack, you can just go out to get, get how and find someone's Vagrant files already done in time and make a new folder called make you make the error LAMP stack CD in that directory. And assuming you have VirtualBox and Vagrant installed and you have those spot, that Vagrant file from that person, type Vagrant up just like I did right here. And it's going to build the whole thing from scratch. And you can have it on your laptop so you can play with this stuff. So you don't actually have to spend all the time putting your tools together. A lot of people have done this already. Just to give an example of that, we can go to github.com. And we can just type in Vagrant. And here's a bunch of people's stuff. Some with React, some with PageKit, LXC provider for Vagrant, CoreOS. Just type in, I don't know if you do any data database stuff, MySQL maybe. So this is a dead simple LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So you literally just go here. You cut, you clone this folder, you enter the directory, and you type Vagrant up, and you'll have all those tools ready to go to play with.
Okay, and it actually installed some stuff, and it failed on some stuff. I got to fix that. I must have wrote my script sometime. But at this particular point, the VM is up, and I can connect into it and do stuff. But of course, my I'm screwed up my script apparently because it failed. Get oh, get not get command not found. Okay, so hold on, I'm gonna go take this wire. Oh, you get example uh, provision. Oh, get is there? Why did that not load? So package check or package check packages local local number of packages. So it's same as that checks. Then it should do DP. Don't install a few. That's weird. I should have checked out everything. We can run it again. So if you can run just the provisioner. So vagrant has got a huge menu. You can resume your VMs. You can stop them. You can provision them. You can do whatever. You can run other plugins. You can connect to someone's VM. You can actually do it in a way that you can share a VM. So if you're running a VM in your house and you want to share it with your coworker who's across the world, you can just be connect and actually connect into his virtual machine. You can work on it together. The problem that you want to solve. It's real simple. It does it auto, pretty much automatically. But what is wrong with this one? I don't know. It's uh, Vagrant provision is how we can actually run the provision script again. It's probably going to fail though because I it failed the first one. It should have just worked. So it's going to run it again. Copy over those files at the top. You can see if I had the Vagrant file, four of them, and then run that shell provision script I created. Yeah, so yum command on foul. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a uh, system for that. So why is the, so something's wrong with the, the, the variable being checked out? So we need to do provision. And we need to do this. Check that out. Okay, well, that's the first thing I can think of. And that, what is that? Yeah, that's OS, that's Debian. So we echo OS, that's the Debian because that file existed. And clearly the, the Red Hat file should not be there. Yeah. So, error say, Line 69. Yeah, so you can actually copy the script over as the script as this file here. So line 69. Oh, I'm an idiot. They're backwards. I messed that up and didn't realize it. Okay, so now <laughs> did anyone see what I did there? Whoops, wrong package managers for the wrong systems. I need to go update all my repos because I copied this one the other day. All right, fair enough. So now we just run Vagrant Provision. And now, presumably I didn't make any more silly mistakes. It should install everything I wanted. So essentially, you got to put in the work before the t before time to actually get the stuff up and running. But once you have it ready to go, you can reuse as much as you want. Oh, I've got to get the new file over. So um, that's right. So, okay. Let's just start from scratch. Easiest way at this point. Because it actually has the old version of the script. I would have to actually manually edit it or not. But let's start again. While we're waiting, so other commands. Vigor status tells you if it's up. Down or what it's doing, the machine's powered off at this particular point, but ready to come back up. What else, what else we do? We have we have um, Vagrant Global Fast, which is a fairly new one. It actually tells you all the Vagrant machines running on your system. Because you see a pain in the ass, you have to go to every Vagrant folder run Vagrant status. But now you can see all of them. I have like four or five VMs running now. <laughs> um, but it's a cool thing to do. And then um, the box stuff. So the box, how you can add your own boxes and repackage them. So if I go in and I make some changes to a VM, I can use once I'm in that directory, I have install the packages I want and everything. I get out of it. I can do Vega box repackage and it actually chain takes that VM and makes it a new one with your stuff in it. And then you can pass that around. Oh, apparently I didn't fix it. Yeah. 
Well, I'd like to look at it later. I don't waste any more time on that. But that was one problem. 